Hello everybody and welcome to me reading you the third book on the yes yeah, third book called Skeleton Key. Okay, so we read, so I'm reading you the third book and uh, chapters and and six and chapter six. Okay, so chapter six. so let's get started. Chapter 6. Not so special agents. Alex stood at the window trying to make sense of the world in which he now found himself. Seven hours on a plane had drained something out of him which even the supplies of a, of a seat in first class had been unable to put back. He, he felt disengaged as, his, as if his body had managed to arrive but had, le- had, le- had left half his brain somewhere behind. He was looking over at the Atlantic Ocean. It was on the other side of a strip of dazzling white sand that stretched into the distance with lounges and umbrellas laid out like measurements on a ruler. Miami, Miami, Miami was at the south, south, southernmost tip of the United States of America and it seemed that half the people who came to the city had simply followed the sun. He could see hundreds of them lying on the backs in the tiniest of bikinis and swimming trunks. Thighs and biceps pounded to, perf- to perfection in the gym and then brought out two roast sun workership workships workshippers. No, these people were here because they worshipped themselves. It was late afternoon and the heat was still intense. But in England, 8,000 kilometres away, it was night and Alex was struggling to stay awake. It was also cold. The air conditioning in the building had been turned up to maximum. The sun might be shining on the other side of the glass, but in this neat, expensive office, he was chilled. Miami ice, he thought. It hadn't been the welcome he had expected. There had been a driver waiting for him when he arrived at the airport. A heavy set man in a suitcase, suitcase with Alex's name on a card. The man was wearing sunglasses that obliterated to his eyes, offering Alex's two reflections of himself. You rider? Yes. The car's this way. The car turned out to be a stretch limousine. Alex felt ridiculous sitting alone in a long, narrow compartment with two leather seats facing each other, a drinks cabinet and a TV screen. It was nothing like a car at all. He was glad that the windows, like the driver's glasses, were darkened. Nobody was able to see in. He watched. He watched as the shops and boatyards on the airport perimeter slipped past, and then they were suddenly crossing the water on a wide causeway that skimmed across the bay, bay towards Miami Beach. Now the buildings were low rise, barely taller than the palm trees that surrounded them, and painted and as painted. Astonishing shades of pink and pale blue. The roads were wide, but more people seemed to be sweeping half naked down the centre of the line on the roller blades than driving. Limous- the limousine stopped outside a ten story white building with lines so sharp it could have been cut out of a giant sheet of paper. There was a coffee bar on the floor on the ground floor with offices up above. Even Alex's cases in the car. They went in through the lobby and took the lift. Elevator, Alex reminded himself, up to the tenth. It opened directly onto the reception area of what looked like an ordinary office with two efficient girls behind a clothing mahogany desk. A sign sign read, Centurion International Advertising, CIA. Alex thought, great. Alex Ryder for Mr. Byron, Byron, 
combine? The driver said. This way. One of the girls just at the door, at the door to one side. Alice wouldn't even have noticed it otherwise. E everything was different on the other side of the reception area. Egg was confronted by the t by two glass tubes with two with two sliding doors. One in, one out. The driver gestured and he stepped inside. The door door closed automatically and there was a hum as he went to the, as he went as he was scanned for both conventional and biology weapons biological weapons yeah he guessed and then the door opened and on the other side and he followed the driver down down a blank empty corridor and into an office i hope you don't feel too feel homesick so far away from england the driver, driver had gone and alex was alone with another with with another man. This one aged about sixty with grizzled white hair and a must mustache. He looked fit, but he moved slowly as if he had just got out of bed or needed to get into it. He was wearing a dark suit that looked out of place in Miami. White shirt and a knitted tie. His name name was Joe Byron 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 and he was deputy director for operations in the convert action section of the CIA. No, Alex said, I feel fine. This wasn't true. He was already wishing that he hadn't come. He would have liked to be back in London, even if it had meant hiding from the trial, tried some, somehow, but he wasn't going to tell Byron that, Byron that. You have... Quite a reputation, Byron said. Do I? You bet, Byron smiled. Dr. Grieve and that guy in England, Herod Sale. Don't worry, Alex. We're not meant to know about these things, but these ain't nothing happens in the world without somebody, someone hearing about it. You can't cough and cab, cab, cab you without someone recording it in Washington. He smiled to himself. I have to hand it to, to you, Brits. Here at the CIA, we've used cats and dogs. We tried to put a cat into the Korean embassy with a bug in its collar. It was a neat operation. I would have worked, but unfortunately, they ate it. But never, but well, we've never used a kid before. Certainly not a kid like you. I shrugged. He knew Biden was trying to be friendly, but at the same time, you know, the old man was uneasy and it showed. You've done some great work for your cat country, Byron include, concluded. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I did it for my country, and he said, "It's just that my country don't give me a lot of choice." Well, you're really, you're really grateful. You've agreed to help us now. You know, the United States and Great Britain have always been a special relationship. We like to help each other. There was an awkward silence. I met your uncle once, Byron said. Iron Rider. He was here in Miami? No, he was in Washington. He was a good man. A good, a good man, Alex. A good agent. I'm sorry to hear. Thanks, Alex said. Byron coughed. You must be <coughs> You must be tired. We've booked you a hotel just a few blocks from here. But first I want you to meet a special agent. Special agents Turner and Troy. They should be here anymore. I mean, Turner and Troy. They were going to be Alex's mother and father. He wondered which one was which. Anyway, the three of you will be leading for leaving for K K O S Q L S Q L T O L T O. The day after tomorrow. By said. He sat down on the arm, arm of a chair. His eyes had never left Alex. You need a bit of time to get over your jet lag. And more importantly, you know you need to get to know your new mum and dad. He hesitated. I should have mentioned to you, Alex, that they weren't too crazy about your part in the operation. Don't get me wrong. They know you're a pretty smart operator, but you were 14. 14 and 3 months, Alex said. Yeah, sure. Byron wasn't 
sure if Alex was serious. Obviously, they're not used to having young people like you around when they're in the field. It bugs them, but they'll get used to it. And the main thing is, once you've helped get them onto the island, you'll be able to you'll be able to keep out of the way, their way. I'm sure Alan Blunt told you just stay in the hotel and enjoy and enjoy yourself. The whole thing should exact uh, should only take a week. Two weeks, top two weeks, tops. What exactly are they are they hoping to achieve? I asked. Well, I need to get into the ca- Casa de Oro. That's Spanish. It means Golden house. It's an old plantation house that that General Sarov has at has at one end of the island. But it's not going to be easy, Alex. The island the island now is and there's a single track of road with water on the other side leading leading up to the outer wall. The place itself is more like a castle than a house. Anyway, that's not your problem. We have people on the island who can help us find a way in. And once we get in, we can bug the place. We have cameras the size of a pin. You know what? You want to know what this general Sarov is doing. Exactly. Byron says, glanced down at his brightly polished shoes and suddenly, I just wondered if the CIA man was keeping something from him. It all sounded too straightforward. And what had Smith said? You can never trust them. Byron seemed pleasant enough, but now he wondered. There was a knock on the door. Without waiting for an answer, a man and a woman walked in. Byron stood up. A- Alex, he said, I'd like to- you to meet Tom Turner and Belinda Troy. People, this is Alex Ryder. The atmosphere in the room became icy in an instant. Alex had never met two people less pleasure to meet him, to see him. Tom Turner was about 40, a handsome man with face close cropped hair, blue eyes and a face that, ma- face that managed to be both, both tough and boyish. He was dressed strangely in jeans, a white open necked shirt and a loose soft leather jacket. There was nothing wrong with the with the clothes, but he just didn't suit him. This was a man who had been moulded by the work he did, with his clean shaven, rather plastic looks. He reminded I of a dummy, dummy in a work, in a shop window. Turn him over, I saw, and you can try to see a CIA stamped on the soles of his feet. Belinda Troy was a couple of years older than him, slim with brown frizzy hair. Tumbling down in her in her shoulders, she could al- she would also be casually dressed in a loose fitting skirt and t shirt with a brightly coloured bag dangling from her shoulders and a loose string of beads around her neck. She didn't seem to be wear- wearing any makeup. Her lips were pressed tightly together, not quite scowling. It's still a hundred miles away from a smile. She reminded I of a school teacher, maybe one in the nursery school. Troy closed the door and sat down. Somehow she had managed to avoid looking at Alex the moment she had entered the room. It was as if she was trying to pretend she, he wasn't there. Alex looked from one to another. The strange thing was that, that, that despite their appearance, since they were something ide- there was something identical about Tom Turner and Belinda Troy. It was as if they, they had, had both survived the same bad accident. They were hard bitten. Emotionless, empty. Now he knew why the CIA need CIA needed him. If they tried to get into the into, to get these two into skeleton key on their own, they'd have to be identified as spies before they even got on the off the plane. It's nice to meet you, Alex. Turner said in a way that made it sound quite the opposite. How was the flight? Troy asked, and then Alex could answer. Guess it must have been a bit scary travelling on your own. I had to close my eyes during takeoff, Alex said. But I st- stopped tent trembling when we got to the 35,000 feet. You're scared of f- flying? Turner was astonished. That's crazy! Troy turned to Brian. 
You're pretty. This kid is a CIA operation, and already we found, we found we found out he's scared of flying. We no no, Blinda Tom, Blinda Tom. Brian was embarrassed. I think I think Alex was joking. Joking? That's fine. He just got a different sense of humour. Troy was tight-lipped. I don't find it funny, she said. If I had this whole idea is crazy. I am sorry, sir. She went up. She went on quickly, before Brian could Brian could interrupt her. You tell me. This boy has a reputation. He's still a minor. Suppose he makes a dumb ass joke when we are in the field. He could blow our cover. And what about th that accident of his? You're not going to tell me he's American. He doesn't sound American, Taylor would. I just want to talk, Brian said. And if he does, I'm sure he could put on an accent. Take off permission to speak, sir. Go ahead, Tuna, Turner. I agree 100% with Special Agent Troy. With Special Agent Troy, I want nothing against Alex, but he's not trained. He's not tested. He's not American. God damn it! Suddenly, Brian was angry. We've been through all this. You know how tough security is on the is on the island, and with Russian with Russian president on the way, it's going to be it's going to be worse than ever. You go into Santiago Airport on your own, and you will make it out on the other side. Remember what happened to Johnson? He went on his own, dressed up as a bird watcher. That was three months ago. And we haven't heard from him since. We'll, fi we'll find us an American kid. That's enough, Turner. Alex had flown th thousands of miles to help us. And I think you can at least show a little appreciation, both of you. Alex, by just trying to sit down. Can I get you anything? Do you want a drink? A Coke? I'm fine, Alex said, and sat down. Byron opened a drawer in his desk and took out a bundle of pe bundle of papers and official documents. Alex recognised the green cover of, of an American passport. Now, this is how we're going to get to work it. To work it, he began. The first thing is, all three of you are going to need fake IDs when you go into San into K O S Q L. Like I thought it would keep it would be easier to keep to keep your first name. So it's Alex Gardiner Gardiner who's going to be travelling with his mum and dad. Tom and Belinda Gardiner uh, Gardiner Dina Diner. Look after these documents, by the way. The agent is provided for maternity false passports, and they have to pull strings to get hold of them. When this is over, I want them back. Let's open the passport. He has made to seek to find his own pho photograph already in place. His age was the same, but according to the passport, he had been born in California. He wondered how it had been done. And, w and when? You live in Los Angeles, Byron explained. You are the hi you're at high school in West Holly, Hollywood. Your dad's in the movie business, and this is a week's vacation to do some diving and see the sights. I'll give you some stuff to stuff to read tonight, and of course, everything's had everything, everything's been backstop. Backstopped. What does that mean, Alex laughed. It means that if anyone else, if anyone asks about the garden, the Gardner family living in L.A., it'll all check out the school, the neighborhood, everything. There are people out there who who will say they've known you all your life. Brian paused. Listen, Alex, you have you have to you have to understand. The United States of America is not at war with Cuba. Sure, we've had different differences, but for the most part, we've managed to live side by side. But do they do their way, Cuba, and that means KOS Squirt is a country in its own right. They they find you a spy, they're going to put you in jail. They're going to integrate, integrate you. Maybe they'll kill you. There's nothing we can do to stop them. It's been three months since we've heard from Johnson, and my gut feeling is we're never going to hear from him again. There was a long silence. Brian realised he's going too far, but nothing's going to happen to you, he said. You're not part of this operation, you're just watching from the sideline. He turned to two agents. 
The important thing is to, is to start acting like a unit. That the you only have two days until you leave. That means spending time together. Miss Alex will be too tired for dinner tonight, but you can start by having breakfast together tomorrow. Spend the day together. Start thinking like a family. That's what you've got to be. It was strange. Lying in a bed lying in bed in Cornwall, I said wished he could belong to a family and now the wish had come true, though not in the way he had intended. Any questions? Brian asked. Yes, sir, I have a question. Turner said to you said. He was sulking. His mouth had become a little more than a straight line quickly drawn across his handsome face. You want us to play? Happy families tomorrow tomorrow. Okay, sir. That's okay, so that if that's an order, I'll do my best. But I think you're forgetting that tomorrow. I meant, I meant, I meant to be seeing the salesman. I don't think he'll be expecting me to turn up with my wife and child. Salesman, Brian was at Byron was annoyed. I'm seeing him at midday. What about Troy? I'll be there as pa- as backup. Troy said. said. This is standard procedure. All right, Brian thought for a moment. The salesman is on the water, right? To Turner, you'll go on the boat, onto the boat. I can stay with Troy on land, safely out of the way. Brian stood up. The meeting was over. Alex felt another wave of tightness surge through him and had to find Doff a yawn. But Brian must have noticed. You get some rest, Alex, he said. I'm sure, I'm sure you and I will meet again. And I am really grateful you agreed to help. He held out a hand Alec, and Alex shook it. But Special Agent Troy was still sullen. We'll have breakfast at 10.30, she said. That'll give you time to read all the paperwork. Not that you'll probably sleep that much anyway. What are you saying? Mm. I've put him at Del- Delano, Byron said. Okay, we'll pick you up there. Turner and Troy turned round and left the room. Neither of them bothered to say goodbye. Don't mind them, Byron said. This is a new situation for them, but they're good agents. Turner entered the military straight after the college, and Troy has worked with him for many times before. They'll look after you when you're out in the field. I'm sure everything will work out fine. But somehow, Alex doubted it, and... And... He was still puzzled. A lot of work. A lot of thought had gone into this operation. False papers with this photograph. He had been prepared before. He had even known he was coming. A whole identity had been set up for him in Los Angeles. And another agent, Johnson, had possibly died. A simple surveillance operation. Byron was nervous. Alex was sure of it. Maybe it's Tuna and Toy too, too. Where to? Whatever happened on Skel- on Skel- Skeleton Key, they weren't telling him the full truth. Somehow he had he'd had to find that out and uh, out for himself. It was a room that didn't. Re- it was a room that didn't really look look like a room at all. It was too big. It had too. It had too many doors and not just doors, but archways, alcoves and a wide terrace open to the sun. The floor was a marble, a chessboard of green and white squares that, some, that seemed somehow to exaggerate its size. The furniture was, was ornate, antique, and it was everywhere. Highly polished tables and chairs, pedestals with vase, vase, vases and statuettes. Huge gold frame mirrors, spectacular chandeliers, a giant stuffed crocodile lay in front of a massive fireplace. The man who had killed it sat opposite. The Admiral Savile was sipping a was sipping black coffee out of a tiny porcelain porcelain cup. Caffeine is addictive, and Savile allowed himself only one. Thimble full of coffee once a day. It was his single vice, and he savoured it. Today he was dressed in a casual li- linen linen suit, but on this man it almost looked formal, with not a crease in it. 
with not a crease in it. So his, his shirt was open at the collar, revealing a neck that could have been carved out of grey stone. A ceiling fan turned slowly a few metres above the deck where he was sitting, savoured the last mouthful of coffee, then lowered the cup and the saucer back onto the desk. The porcelain made no sound as it came to rest on the polished surface. There was a knock at the door, one of the doors, and the man walked into the room. Walk, walked, walked. However, however, what was the wrong word? There was no word to describe exactly how this man moved. Everything about him was wrong. His head. His head sat at, a, sat, sat at an angle on his shoulders, which were, them, which were themselves crooked and hunched. His right arm was shorter than his left arm. His right leg, however, was several centimetres longer than his left. His feet was encased in black leather shoes, one heavier and larger than the other. He was wearing a black leather jacket and jeans, and as he approached Sarov, Sarov, as he approached Sarov, his muscles rippled beneath the cloth, as if with life of their own. Nothing in his body was co- coordinated. So, so although he was moving for forward, he seemed to be trying. He seemed to be trying to go backwards, or sideways. His face was the worst part of him. It was as if. It was as if it had been taken to pieces and put back together again by a child with only a raw knowledge of the human form. There were about a dozen scars on his neck and about around his cheek, one of his, around his cheek. One of his eyes were red, permanently bloodshot. He had a long colourless hair on one half of his head. On the other, he was completely bald. Although it would have been impossible to tell from looking at him, this man was only 28 years old. Until a few years ago, it had, he had been the most feared terrorist in Europe. His name was Con- Conrad. There was very little known about him, although it was said that he was, that he was Turkish, that he had been born in Ista- Istanbul, the son of a butcher, and that when he, that was, that when he was nine, he had blown up his school with a bomb made in chemistry chemistry class when he was given a detention for being late. Again, nobody knew who had trained Conrad, or, for that matter, who had employed him. He was a chameleon. He had no political beliefs and operated simply for money. Money. It was believed that he had had been responsible for outrageous, outrages in Paris. Madrid, Athens, and London. One thing was certain: the security services of nine different countries were after him. He was number four on the CIA's most wanted list. This and there was an office official bounty of two million dollars on his head. His career has come to an un, had to a kind of sudden come to a sudden and unexpected end when a bomb that he had been carrying, intended for an army base, had detonated. It detonated earlier. The bomber had lit- quite literally blown him apart, but it hadn't quite managed to kill him. It had been sp- it had been stitched back together by a team of Albanian doctors in a research centre near El Bazin. It was a handy work that was so visible now. He was working as Sarov's person- Sarov's personal assistant and secretary. He had done so for two years. Such work would have been beneath him, but Conrad had little choice now, and anyway, he understood the scope of Sarov's vision. He knew that the Russian intended to create Conrad would have his rewards. Good morning, comrade, Sarov said. He spoke in fluent in English, in smooth, fluent English. I hope we've to, we've to managed to recover the rest of the blank knots from the swamp. Conrad nodded. He preferred not to speak. Excellent. The money will, of course, have to be lowered. Then it can be paid back into my account. 
So I read down and opened a leather bound diary. There was a number of entries, each one in perfect handwriting. Everything is proceeding according to the schedule. He went on the construction of the bomb. Complete. Conrad seemed to have difficulty getting the word out of his mouth. He had to twist his face to make it all happen at all. I knew I could rely on you. The Russian president will be arriving here in just five days' time. I had an email from his confirming it today. Boris tells me how much he's looking forward to be his holiday. Sarah smiled briefly. I, it will, of course, be a holiday that he is unlikely to of course, get forget. You have the rooms prepare, prepared? Conrad nodded. The camera, cameras? Yes, General. Good. Sarah ran a finger down the diary pages. He stopped a single word that had been underlined with a question mark. There still remains the question of the uranium. He said, I always knew that the purchase and delivery of nuclear material would be dangerous and delicate. The men in the aircraft had threatened me and they had paid the price, but they were of course working for a third party. The salesman, Conway said. Indeed, by now salesman would have heard what happened to the messenger. Messenger boys, when the, when no further payment arrives from me, he his, he alert, decide to go ahead with his threat and alert the authorities. It's unlikely, but it's a risk. I am not prepared to take. We have less than two weeks until the bomb is detonated and the world takes then the world takes on the shape that I have decided to give it. We cannot take any chances, and so, my dear Conrad, you must go to my army and remove the salesmen from our lives. Will, which will I fear involve removing from, from removing him from he, from his? Where is he? He operates out of a boat, a cruise liner called Mayfair Lady. It usually it's usually moored at the Bayside Marketplace. Salesman feels safer on the water. Speaking personally, speaking for Bernie, I will feel safer when he's underneath it. So I have closed the diary. The meeting was over. You can leave straight away. It will report to me when it's done. Conrad nodded a third time. The metal pins in his neck rippled briefly as his head moved up and dragged himself out of the room. Right, everybody, that's it. that'll be the end of me reading you today's book of Alex Ryder. So bye bye everyone and thank you for listening to this book. Bye-bye.